This here is the reality of evil. Thank you. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about the reality of evil. Now, um, I want to do three things if I can. One is to explain how evil, evil can be real. Number two is really just an extension of number one to show how injury can be real. And then to explain how in more detail we understand the reality of evil. Well, let's start at the beginning. For many people, the reality of evil is a problem. Because on the one hand, look at our world. Our world, it seems, is full of evil. On the other hand, if God is good, all good, perfectly good, and God is running the world, how could there be evil? And wasn't there someone in the Talmud named Nochum who had terrible tragedies occur to him? And every time one of these terrible tragedies occurred, he used the expression, Gam Zula Tova, this too is for good. We've learned that expression. That's become something that the Jewish people expresses. And his student, Rabbi Akiva, paraphrased the same idea. Everything that God does is for good. So it sounds like, on the one hand, we're confronted by massive evil in the world. And on the other hand, from a religious point of view, we can't accept the idea of evil. And people then feel pressed to say that the evil must be an illusion. It must be an illusion. We're just not getting it. If we would penetrate more deeply, see it more accurately, we would discover that there's really no evil. On the other hand, we do have Jewish sources which seem to indicate that there is evil. There's a verse that says, God is Yotzer or of Ori Choshech, Ose Sholom Uvorei Ra. God forms light and creates darkness, makes peace and creates evil. Okay, I know in your Siddur it ends, Ose a cold. He makes everything. But um, that's not how it ends in the verse in Isaiah. <clears throat> the office of the Siddur meant that he's responsible for everything, including evil. But it says so. Then you have a verse in Lamentations. From the mouth of the Most High shall not come out evils and good. Now Rashi says to read that verse as a negative interrogative. Is it not the case that from the mouth of the Most High shall come out evils and good? Which means they do come out. Indeed, since the verse does say good, it's hard to wave it away and say it's not really true. Good definitely comes from God. And the verse puts evils and good back to back. So that verse seems to say, and Rashi says it explicitly, that evil does come from God. Then you have a Mishnah which says, when something good happens to you, you make one blessing. When something bad happens to you, the word there is ra, evil. You make another blessing. For the good thing, you say God is good and does good. For the bad thing, you say that God is the true judge. The Mishnah says, when something bad happens to you, make this blessing. That means not only do bad things happen, but you can tell the difference. You're able to tell the difference because this is practical law. You have to know when to make each blessing. So there have to be criteria by which you can tell when something evil happens. Okay, so now we have sources on the other side. But now we have, at best, a contradiction in the sources. Contradiction in the ideas. You know, it's, that makes it worse. <laughs> now what I want to show you is how you can live with the idea that evil is real. I'm going to say it straight. Then I'm going to add something which I've never used in these lectures before. Because it came out to me only in a conversation I had with one of my chavrusas, one of my study colleagues, who's a very bright person. 
And I began to realize why some people have a terrible resistance here, so I'll try to explain that. First of all, let's consider Nochem and Rabbi Akiva. Nochem said, Gamzu Tova. This too is for good. Now, if you thought Nochem was denying the reality of evil, then what he says isn't quite right, is it? This too is for good. Isn't there one word there that doesn't belong if he's trying to deny the reality of evil? Which word ought to be left out? I got a lot of twos, but the right answer is four. This too, this also, is for good. Why put in the four? If it's good by itself, he should have said, this too is good. The two means, it doesn't look good. I understand you think of it as bad, but I'm telling you to tell you a surprise. If he's denying evil, he should have said, this too is good. Not this too is for good. For good seems to indicate that it will bring you to good in the future, but not that it's good right now. In the Hebrew, it's one letter. It's a lamed. But our rabbis, when they spoke, every letter was counted. Every letter has to be taken seriously. And Rabbi Akiva imitated that aspect of the phraseology. He said, everything that God does is for good. So maybe those sources aren't on the other side. Maybe those sources do agree that evil is real. But what to do about the fact that God is running the world and he's all good, perfectly good. The answer here is that evil is real and it is a necessary means to a greater good. The evil that exists is a necessary means to a greater good. And when we say that God is all good, we're thinking of God as an agent. As an agent, he's all good, even though he creates evil. Let me give you an, 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 a comparison. What this uh, could, could make this idea more, more uh, down to earth and uh, user friendly. You have a doctor who, a pediatrician, who immunizes children against diseases. He uses an injection because that's the current method. Now, when he sticks the kid with the needle, he's causing pain. And he's immunizing the child against the disease. That means his action has mixed effects. Hurting the kid is bad. Immunizing him against the disease is good. How do I know that hurting the kid is bad? Because next year, when they invent a pill, you don't expect the doctor to continue to use the, the needle. Using the needle is bad. Why did he do it the first year? Because there was no other way to immunize the child. It means that the doctor is doing something that's part bad and part good. Should we say then, we should we use this action as a window onto his moral character and say, well, you know, this doctor's a mixed bag. On the one hand, he's immunizing the child against the disease, but he must be a little sadist, you know, because he's hurting the kid. We don't have to say that. The doctor could be perfectly good morally. He could have a perfectly sterling, virtuous character. He's doing something evil because it's necessary for a greater good. That's how doing evil doesn't brand the agent as evil. It depends upon why he's doing the evil. He's doing the evil because it's the only way to get to a greater good. Then the agent can be wholly good, even though the action is evil or contains evil. When someone says, why did X happen? And the answer is, look, down the road, down the road, you'll see that X will bring you to Z. And Z is terrific. What then are you saying about X? What you're saying about X is that X is not good. Because if X were good by itself, you wouldn't have to go to Z. You could say, look more carefully at X and you'll see that X by itself is good. What do I care that it brings you to Z? The minute you're stretched, the minute you're pushed to have to go to a far consequence and say, look, it brings to a terrific consequence in the end, that means you're giving up on the thing itself being good. And that is what Nochem Ishkamzu and Rabbi Kiva said. This too is for good. Everything that God does is for good. So, this is how we are going to accept the idea that there is evil, even though God is perfectly good. We mean by God being perfectly good, that as an agent, he's perfectly good. His purposes are perfectly good. His so-called moral character would be perfectly good. 
even though he himself creates evil. Are we together so far? Well, there ought to be an objection here. The reason why we're tolerating the evil is because it is a necessary means to a greater good. One word there ought to ring <laughs> alarm bells in your, in, your, in your mind. Well, okay, you've been here too long. Let's get somebody to say, yeah. How could we say that God is doing it as judgment if it's for a greater good in the end? How could it be also considered judgment? Oh, okay. That's an interesting question, how it could be considered judgment, but I haven't used that term. Even within my own discussion, there's one word in the, in the, in the formula I gave you which ought to ring alarm bells. We said it means to uh, greater good. Yes. Evil is the means to good. I mean, doesn't the sort of means imply the end to some extent? In that, you know? Let's see. The, does the means not imply the end to some extent? Let's go back to the doctor. The doctor is hurting the child in order to immunize him. Hurting the child is an evil because next year when he can do it without hurting him, he ought not to hurt him. Right? So therefore, hurting him is evil. Now, does the evil in hurting him mean that the end is bad? Or I'm not sure that that <coughs> analogy fits for every case. Why not? I mean, for every case? So that will have, to be, will have to be filled in how it fits for every case. But taking it as a principle, there's one word there that ought to ring alarm bells. I'm surprised nobody's, you know, tearing down the rafters. Yeah. Oh, necessary. Necessary. Hmm. The means is necessary to get to the greater good. Necessary for God? God can't get there without the means? God? Okay, our poor doctor, you know, he's limited. He's only human. At that point in medical research, all you have is an injection. You don't have a pill. <clears throat> I'm a type 1 diabetic. I inject myself all the time. They're now perfecting sniffed insulin. I'm waiting for the day, frankly, when I can sniff it and I don't have to inject myself. In the meantime, I have to inject myself because otherwise I'll die. Right? Injecting myself isn't pleasant. It's just a necessary means to a greater good, like staying alive. Right? So, here, um, but for God, why would it be necessary for God to use an evil means to get to the greater good? Surely God is all-powerful. Surely God is all-powerful. And if He's all-powerful, then He doesn't need any means to get to an end. He can get there straight without any compromise. Why would God have to use a means, an evil means, to an end? If it's on this subject, I'll take it. If it's on something else, I, won't, I don't want to hear it now. Because it's not for God, but it's for us. Because like, we, no matter how many times, you know, you can have a prophet say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Nobody listens. You have a teacher that tells you don't talk. You shouldn't talk about it. So until like something bad happens to you, and like I don't know where I read it or one of the rabbis who said it, but like let's say I have Abu Dhabi so the prophets could have said not to do it, and you know not to do it. But the temple, when the temple was destroyed, if that was the reason for it, now that makes you realize okay, yeah. that was. Okay, look, you're inside the picture. You're already inside the picture, and you're taking one piece and comparing it with another piece. I'm outside the picture. I haven't gotten there yet. I want to know why... It's not for God. One second. I want to know why God didn't create the world to come straight without this world at all. Let alone that if a person makes a mistake, then he has to be corrected and things have to happen. Otherwise, he won't listen. You're already inside the world, manipulating one piece against another. Why not go straight to the world to come without this world, without the commandments, without the failures, without the need to correct the failures? That whole package has to be justified. We're starting really at the very beginning. Yeah. Okay, don't you have to have evil in order to appreciate what good is? I don't think so. I know that this is a very common idea, but I don't think it's correct. Um, first of all, if it were correct, then no universal statement would be true. Everything is L. But that couldn't be true because if everything is L, then you couldn't appreciate what L is. And we, I think, want to say that there are universal statements that are true. What you need really is the concept. You need the concept of the alternative. It's true. I can't appreciate what um, justice is if I don't have the concept of injustice. That's quite correct. But I don't have to have real injustice. If you consider the span of time that someone lives in this world compared to an eternity in the world to come, isn't it kind of 
becoming just a small you know, spot in, in, in your eternal life? Okay, this world is very small in time, and it's a, and it's a small spot, actually infinitely small, given that t- eternity is infinite. Yes, but if we're talking about a perfect God, then he ought not to do any evil at all. Not even a tiny bit, not even a bit that's so small that when you compare with eternity, it vanishes in terms of its size. He ought not do any evil at all, unless there's a justification. Now, this justification I'm offering is that the evil is a necessary means to a greater good, and we're asking... How could it be necessary for God? Necessary? Surely, being all-powerful, he could get to the end without going through this intermediary stage. I'm going to have to give the answer because we'll never, we'll never get finished. Okay, go ahead. Um, this God, can't, um, God can't allow free will. It's the only way he can allow free will um, and still see like the true measure of the individual. Okay, I think you're, you're heading in the right direction, but the critic will say, how do you use the word can't with respect to God? That's, the, that's where the critic stops. When you, when you say can't about oh God, you know, that's just going off the page. Yeah. I think the evil is talking about our perspective on evil, and I think God's perspective on evil could be, he can view it as good, but when we view it as, as evil. Okay, this is very, very important. This gentleman asks, maybe our perspective on evil is different from God's, and what we call evil, God could, could view as good. I think we should resist this. I think we should resist this. After all, God communicated to us. And He communicated to us in language that was designed to be meaningful to us. To think, okay, we call murder evil. Maybe for God, evil is petunias. Or maybe it's the Beatles, which is probably pretty close. You know, it couldn't be Beethoven. And uh, maybe evil is neutrons. I mean, who knows what evil is for God? Now, if that were true, then God couldn't communicate to us using that language. The whole of the Bible is a communication from God to us about how we should look at the world, what things we should think of, how we should relate to them, and also about what He is. One verse in Psalm says, Tamuru kitov Hashem, taste and see that God is good. If we weren't able to trust our concepts of good and evil, we could never do what that verse says. So I don't think we should take refuge in the idea that God's concepts are so different from ours that we can't Deal with our own concepts with confidence. I'm going to once, once around for each person, then I'm going to, and I'm going to. Uh, okay. Do you, like, there's evil in the world because if God just created the world to come, man wouldn't deserve it. Man has to earn his place in the world to come, and therefore, man could choose good, and man could choose evil, and since well, man is man, he unfortunately chooses evil more often than good. Okay. There needs to be. Told. I see. You and he are both going down the same path. You're both going down the same path, and I'm, I'm not even going to criticize it now because I think you're, you have the basically right uh, path to go down. Because I'm a logician, I care about the, the exact way it's formulated, but I think your intuitions are, are, are both correct. Let me tell you now what I think the, the right answer is to this, which may be a little surprising to you. It's worth knowing on its own, and I'll show you how it works here. God is all-powerful. All-powerful. What does that mean? Does that mean God can do anything? Anything at all? Imagine. Imagine. God can blank. Now just fill in the blank and it's got to be true because God is all powerful. I don't think that's correct. Consider the following examples. How about God can learn something new? Learning something new is a genuine ability. Everyone in this room has that ability. Does God have the ability to learn something new? How about God can improve? Improving is a genuine ability. Everyone in this room has that ability. Does God have the ability to improve? Doesn't sound right, does it? Now, I'll put one in as a footnote, if it isn't immediately obvious to you. What about God can commit suicide? We won't allow that one either. So the first point is this. There are certain abilities that are built on imperfection. Only something that's imperfect has these abilities. You can only learn something new if you don't already know everything, right? You can only improve if you're not already perfect. So these abilities are built on imperfection. Of course, God is perfect. So any ability that tags imperfection we're not going to allow God to have. What we should have said is, God is all-powerful means God can do everything that a perfect being 
should be able to do. And limit all powerful by perfection, not going to be on, go beyond perfection. Now, I say that by way of putting it aside to introduce you to another category which is very different. Category which is very different from what I just told you. Let's consider the following examples. God has challenged me to a game of chess. But because he's a much better player than I am, he's given me a handicap. He's playing with only his king. Okay? I have all my pieces. But he's playing with only his king. <laughs> Query. Can God checkmate me? No. With only his king? Okay. Can God divide two into five evenly with no remainder? Can God correctly spell the English word table with four letters? Final example. Table spelled T-A-B-L-E. Do I have to remind you of this? Okay. <laughs> I know education is going down, but still. <laughs> now, how about this? There was a time when you, get, when you got exams in university, you got an exam booklet filled with questions. Now, you take your booklet. Question one says, copy the paragraph on, on page six into your answer notebook. Okay. So you start turning the pages. One, two, three, four, five. In the middle of five, the text comes to an end with the words, end of exam. There is no page six. Can God ace that exam? Now, I'm glad you answered as you did. Even though we're talking about God, and God is all-powerful, talking about checkmating with just the king, or dividing two into five evenly, or spelling table with four letters seems to go beyond the pale. Something seems to be wrong there. Our sources, Maimonides, the Malbim, others, say we don't um, assign to God the ability to make square circles. Here's the rule. If when we talk about what's to be done, we contradict ourselves, then it's off limits. Because if we contradict ourselves, we're not making sense. You ask, can God X... Let's take a look at X. If when you ask, can God X, you're contradicting yourself, the correct response is, what? What did you say? I know they were words, but you know, no idea comes into my mind with those words. You're not communicating. You said, can God make square circles? Now, I hear square circles, and nothing comes in. I hear square, I hear circle, but when you put them together, it's a blank. To me, you haven't asked the question. Which means, the appropriate reaction to someone who says, can God make square circles, is not to answer. You don't say yes or you don't say no. Because to say yes or no credits the question with raising a real question. That there is something about which it's been asked, can God do it? But in this case, there's no it. Make square circles isn't an it about which you can ask to be done or not to be done. Because square circles are a contradiction. It's not a limitation on God. It's a limitation on how we talk. There are rules of talk which enable us to make sense. If we break those rules, we don't make any sense. If we don't make any sense, we're not raising any questions and we're not communicating. So, whenever there's a contradiction in the blank, God can blank, if the stuff in the blank is a contradiction, no, no statement is being made. That's why I stressed when I talk about learning something new, that learning something new is a genuine ability there's no contradiction there. Everyone in the room has it. There we say God doesn't have it. We're asserting that he doesn't have it. Improving is a genuine ability. People in this room have it. It's perfectly meaningful. There's no contradiction there. And we say God doesn't have the ability to improve. When it comes to making square circles, our position is we won't say that he can and we won't say that he can't because there's no it about which we could make such judgments. Making square circles isn't an it about which you can ask, can he or can he not do it? Okay? Now, as a footnote, you probably have heard that old chestnut, um, can God make a stone too heavy for him to lift? And here the critic says, you're a believer in omnipotence, hey? Watch, I've got you. What are you going to say? God can create a stone too heavy for him to lift? Then he can't lift it. That's one thing he can't do. You say he can't create it? So there's certainly something he can't do. He can't create such a stone. Either way, I've got you that he can't do something. And then it's time to order the cheeseburgers because you now know the Torah has to be false, right? But it's a little premature. It's a little premature, as you could probably guess from the fact that I'm sitting here. <clears throat> because stone too heavy for God to lift is contradictory. 
And therefore, my response when the person asks me, can he or can he not create a stone too heavy for him to lift? And he's waiting for a yes answer or a no answer. My response is, I'm not answering yes, I'm not answering no, because you haven't asked the question. Because you've contradicted yourself. Why is stone too heavy for God to lift a contradiction? Because, let's see what it means. Stone too heavy for God to lift means stone so heavy that God, who's all-powerful, can't lift it. Which means stone so heavy that God, who can lift anything, can't lift it. Which means stone so heavy that God, who can lift it, can't lift it. Which is an obvious contradiction. So this phrase, which the critic, you know, this is his ticket to buy the cheeseburger. Wasted ticket. Right? Because he feels he's going to force us into a yes or no answer, and he wins on a yes and he wins on a no, our response is, it's self-contradictory. Because it's self-contradictory, you haven't asked the question. And therefore, I'm not going to answer yes, I'm not going to answer no. I only answer questions. I don't answer nonsense. Okay, you with me? Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. Again, why, sorry, quickly, why is it again a contradiction? Okay. Stone too heavy for God to lift means stone too heavy that God, who's omnipotent, who's all-powerful, can't lift it. Which means stone too heavy that God, who can lift anything, can't lift it. Which means stone so heavy that God can lift it and can't lift it. And that's a contradiction. To say he can and cannot is a contradiction. Okay. Why did we do all this? Because we were worried about evil as a necessary means to good. Suppose, suppose, when we analyze the good end carefully enough, and we analyze the evil means carefully enough, when someone asks, why doesn't God just create the end without the means? He'll be contradicting himself. A description of getting to the end without the means will be a contradiction. And then we will say to him, I'm sorry, since you contradicted yourself, it doesn't call for a response. You haven't raised an item for consideration because it's a contradiction. Where is the contradiction? I will do this for you briefly. It's the second chapter in the Way of God by Lutzato which is a very, very difficult chapter, but at least as much as I can extract from it will we'll give you at least a, a, a um, surface understanding of why getting to the end uh, is, uh, is would contradict it by uh, denying the means. And now I'm coming to what you said and what you said. This is where I think you had the right intuition. What is the end? The end is that God should create us in a way that we have the maximum good. God created us out of loving kindness, benevolence, to express His goodness. So what He creates should have the maximum good. That's the maximum benevolence. What is the maximum good? He is the maximum good. We already said that He's perfect. Perfect means that than which there is no better. Perfect means something which can't be improved, can't be made more good. So if he's going to create us and give us maximum good, what he has to give to us is himself. Strictly, I suppose, one ought to think of God creating God. God's, more God, more God's stuff, something like that. Because God is the greatest good. But that's going too far. That itself is a contradiction because God, by definition, isn't created. He's creator. If God's going to create something, it's going to be a creature. Being a creature means that it can't be God. So let's say it a little better. Uh, Lusato actually goes through all these steps. Let's say it a little better. God will make a creature who has as much godliness as a creature can have. A creature can't be God. To give maximum good is to give God, but you're giving God to a creature. So you make the creature as godly as a creature can be. However godly a creature can be, that's what you want to get in the end. Now, that's the reason why it says in Genesis that we are created in God's... Okay, you're familiar with the phrase image. It really means form. Why is it that way? It's a verse in Genesis. For most people, that's just an axiom. That's what it says. Lutzato's philosophy is deep enough to go behind that verse and explain the, po- the point of that verse. Why wasn't God satisfied with horses? Or, uh, 
insects, you know, or palm, palm trees. Because he would not have given the maximum good. The maximum good is to be like God. That's why the top of the line in terms of creation is a creature who can be like God. As godly as a creature can be. Now, what does it mean to be godly, godlike, similar to God? Well, one thing that's true about God and that we need to be able to have as a similarity is this, that God is totally self-determined, self-contained, self-sufficient, independent. God is what He is because of Himself. Nothing makes God, nothing creates God, nothing affects God, nothing changes God. That's part of what perfection means. It's totally self-contained, totally self-sufficient. I have to wait until I finish this line of, of reasoning. Now, He's totally and absolutely self-sufficient, self-contained, self-determined. What about us? Could we be self-determined, self-sufficient, self-contained totally? Is that possible for us? No, it's not possible. And the deepest reason can be given in three words. Why it's not possible for us to be totally self-determined, self-contained, self-defined, self-sufficient? Because we are creatures. We're created. Something that's created can't be totally self-defined. Something else is creating it. That's a big loss in your independence. You're dependent for your existence on a creator who makes you. But we could be partly self-defined. What is it about a human being that enables them to be partly self-defined? Free will. We talked about this. Free will. In free will, you create your own history, you have your own impact on the world, and you also create yourself. Every action you do has an impact on who you become. What we do out of free will is something that we create. And that's something that we've brought into existence. God didn't bring it into existence. He gave us the power to bring things into existence on our own. And in that respect, we're similar to him. In these things, we are self-defined, self-determined. That's one step. We can share with him at least the bottom line. That was meant to avoid eight minutes of discussion. At least the bottom line that we have some measure of, self -de uh, of self-determination as in comparison to him. Now, what about the others? We should share with him Moral characteristics and spiritual characteristics. Moral and spiritual characteristics only apply to a creature that has free will. A creature or an entity of any kind that doesn't have free will has no moral characteristics. Suppose I program my computer with a virtual agent to search the internet with all, for all sorts of interesting information. And every Thursday night, it's sent out to my recipient list of 500 addresses. So the people all over the world, when they get up Friday morning turn on their computers or look at the screen. There's this free information that I'm sending to them. Now imagine a person in Wyoming gets up Friday morning and says, wow, look at that. Gottlieb's computer is so generous. Gottlieb's computer is so kind. Gottlieb's computer is so humanitarian. <laughs> We're getting pretty dangerous now, right? Um, if he says that, then something's gone wrong. I suppose you could find academics will say it, but then something's gone wrong with them as well. Um, it isn't the computer that's kind, that's generous, that's humanitarian, that's sympathetic. Maybe I qualify for those titles. I programmed it. I'm paying the electricity bill. You know, <laughs> I'm running the computer. But the computer doesn't qualify because it's a hunk of metal. And it doesn't make any free choices. Only a, a thing that makes free choices can be kind and generous and humanitarian or the opposite. Or the opposite. When the lion chases down the gazelle and rips its flesh from the gazelle while it's alive, kills it that way. <clears throat> we don't describe the lion as vicious, evil, criminal. It's an animal. And because it's an animal, we don't use those moral qualities those moral epithets with respect to the lion. 
And this should be a lesson for those who are tempted to use positive moral qualities for animals, which is basically a political muddling of your otherwise rational thought, you know, that dogs can really love and, and so forth and so on. If the dogs can love, then the, then the lions have to be evil. And I don't think we want to say that. So, um, moral qualities are only for creatures that have free will. So, by giving us free will, God is doing two things. He's making it possible for us to be partly self-determined and also to resemble Him in moral and spiritual qualities. He created this world as an expression of loving kindness. When we practice loving kindness, we are thereby godlike because we are in a self-determined way doing loving kindness. Now, that's how we achieve the greatest good. We achieve the greatest good by becoming godlike in that way. But of course, as everyone knows, free will carries with it the possibility of doing evil. Free will carries with it the possibility of doing evil. That's why it's really free. It's free that you can do good or evil. And that possibility of doing evil is part and parcel of the creation. There's no way to get to the end without going through that means. That's not all the evil there is, but that's one source of it. Now let's trace the steps. I'll show you that at each step, if you try to go down the step and deny the, the conclusion, you get a contradiction. The goal is being godlike. Being godlike means you have to have free will, because otherwise you aren't self determined, and therefore you're not godlike. So somebody says, wait a minute, we're talking about God now, after all. Why can't he make us godlike without making us self determined? Because that's what godlike means. Godlike means having his qualities. And the basis for all qualities we could share with him is being self-determined. If you're a squirrel, you're not godlike at all because you don't share any qualities with God. <coughs> That's just what it means. And then, free will, by very definition, means the possibility of doing evil. So already evil is, is implicated. So this is a, at least a summary, capsule form, of how you can see that Getting to the end without going through the evil means is going to be a contradiction. And because it's a contradiction, cannot, the question cannot be raised, why doesn't God just get to the end and not use the means? That would be like saying, why doesn't God create square circles? And that's not a question. Okay, I'll stop for about five minutes for questions, and I want to go on to the, to the last point that I want to make. Questions up to here? Where's Santa right here? Okay, the, the Torah says that when he created light and other things, he saw that it was good. The seeing there, if you look into Nachmanides and others, seeing there means projecting into the item, projecting into the item the ability to continue to function as it's functioning. He's not learning something new, but he's projecting into the item. That's based on how the word is used in the Tanakh and the, and the rest of it. But that, that's, that's really what it means. Yeah. Um, <coughs> This might be a question for later, but I'll answer right now. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Uh, you know, statement. Several, some people say that the Holocaust was a means um, for Israel to come about, because that was the evil that the Israel to do. Well, um, first of all, I, I do want to I do want to mention um, the Holocaust is a subject that deserves more than ninety seconds. So, to expect a full and satisfying answer about the Holocaust when it's raised as a question in the midst of another topic is really unrealistic. Um, I have a whole sheer on it, and it's on, it's on my website, and you can listen to that. But in the meantime, I, I'm not going to deal with the Holocaust in, in 90 seconds in the middle of uh, a sheer that's devoted to another topic. Uh, but I will say this. <clears throat> the particular item that you asked about the Holocaust as a means to the state of Israel. Now, I just um, argued to say that God uses a means to an end, it's got to be a necessary means. It's got to be a necessary means. If it isn't necessary, then we can ask, why didn't God get to the end without the means? And here, I think it's obvious that the state of Israel doesn't require as a prelude to the Holocaust, not for God. Right? 
The only way that I'm allowing the means to be necessary for the end is if I state the end and contradict the means, I've got myself a contradiction. Right? And that's certainly not going to be the case with getting to the, the state of Israel without, without having the Holocaust. So here, I think it's just... Uh, it's uh, a kind of primitive, thoughtless theology which uh, is typical of certain political circles and it has no, it has, has no, no cogency. Has no cogency. Why would God need that in order to, in order to get back? I'm not talking about Zionism now. I'm not talking about the Holocaust now. I'm talking about ne- evil as a necessary means to good. Yeah. Okay, so the only thing I'm wondering is if, uh, like we were only good and we were just the angels and we were going to redeem them then? Because we just created this good with our own evil? We just be like angels? Okay. Uh, there's a tricky question that lies in your words somewhere and I'm not going to address it now because it's, it's very philosophical. Um... If he created us as good, meaning that we then really didn't have free will, then we wouldn't be godlike at all. The angels are not godlike at all. But don't angels like, have the ability to do it? It's just like they can't do it? Like they can't choose to do it? If you say they have the ability and they can't do it, is a contradiction. It's like, I don't know, it's just like one of the rabbis said, I can't remember who it was, it was just like, you put your hand in fire, but you know, like, it's just you don't do it. So it's like, as much as you could do it, like, you're not going to do it. Well, then I think could requires a little bit of an analysis of the psychology. If you're a person who has a choice between A and B, and your whole psychology and all your motivations are in favor of A, and nothing is in favor of B, then you really can't do B. Because there's nothing in you that will respond to B. To do it, you've got to have something in you that says yes. If everything in you says no, then you're not not exercising free will when you choose A. You're not choosing A. You're just doing A like a robot. There's got to be conflict for there to be free will. That's part of our definition of free will. That's why there's a soul and a body, so there'll be conflict, so that free will could cast a deciding vote. And when it, if it's too far out of balance, then indeed you don't have free will. But isn't there some things that some people would just never do as you have other things that are accepted? It will vary from person to person. No question about that. But the, but the point is, if you create someone where his all psychology is in, in one side of the choice, then he's not exercising free will. Okay, let me go to the, to the, to the final point, which is an ex- application of this, and which for many people is even more surprising. Is it possible to really injure someone? A injures B or kills B. Should we say God is running the world and nothing escapes his notice? If A succeeds in injuring or killing B, then B needed that. He must have done something wrong or in kinder cases maybe it was he finished his job in this world but since God is running the world, it must be that God decreed that injury or that uh, death for B. That's the only way that A would have been able to achieve it. I think that there is here a third truth. So he says half truth. This is about one third true and two thirds false. Now let me try to disentangle it for you and show you where I think the, tr- the truth lies. A few weeks ago, we read about the brother is selling Joseph into slavery. Reuven says to them, if you look carefully, he says two things. This is the first year that I got this. First he says to them, let's not kill him. The brothers don't respond. Then Reuven says, let's throw him into the pit. Now, the brothers know that throwing him into the pit is a death sentence. So they go along with it. The Torah tells us, Reuven's thought was, that I'm going to come back and rescue him from the pit. He sold it to them because they thought he would die there. Why should he die there? Because as the Talmud says, there were snakes and scorpions there. And Ruben says, I'm going to come back and save him. The Orachim raises the following fairly obvious question. If there are snakes and scorpions there, and that's why the brothers agree to throw him in, I'm putting that part in, if that's why they agree to throw him in, why does Ruben think Joseph will be alive when he comes back to get him. And here's what the Orachim says. The Orachim says, maybe Joseph has enough merit that God will do a miracle for him in the pit and the snakes and scorpions won't touch him. But if the brothers get hold of him, they will succeed in killing him. In other words, let me broaden the uh, stage for you so you'll see how the whole stage looks. How much merit does Joseph have? Maybe he is a gigantic tzaddik. 
he has an enormous amount of merit, in which case, God will save him no matter what. He'll save him from the pit and he'll save him from the brothers. In that case, Reuben is doing nothing. By diverting him to the pit, Reuben's doing nothing. He'll be saved either way. Or maybe Joseph has so little merit that he'll be killed either way. The brothers will kill him and in the pit he'll die for the snakes and scorpions. In that case, Reuben's doing nothing. Diverting him from the brothers to the pit accomplishes nothing. But maybe, maybe Joseph is in the middle. In the middle means that in the pit God will do a miracle to save him, but the brothers will succeed in killing him. If Joseph is in that middle case, then Reuben is saving his life. By telling the brothers, don't kill him bodily, just throw him into the pit, Reuben will be saving his life. Okay, it's not guaranteed, but neither is surgery guaranteed. There's, out of the two, three cases, one case is a case in which, by throwing him into the pit, Joseph, uh, Reuben will, is organizing that Joseph's life should be saved. Now, let's think about this. So Joseph is in a condition where in the pit, God will do a miracle to save him. And if the brothers get hold of him, they'll succeed in killing him. Let's ask the obvious question. What does God want here? Does God want Joseph alive or dead? <laughs> it seems like whatever you say, something in the description contradicts you. Will you say that God wants Joseph alive? Then how will the brothers be able to kill him? If God wants Joseph alive, then nothing can fight against God. If he wants him alive, he'll be alive. I, you'll tell me God wants Joseph dead? Then how come in the pit God will do a miracle to save him if God wants Joseph dead? We seem to be describing a situation in which we can't get any consistent description of what God wants. Now, this is a mistake. The problem here is a mistake. I'll explain to you why. I'll give you a practical example from everyday life. So you see, it's just a mistake. What you have here is really two questions falsely collapsed into one. And when you ask each one, what does God want? You're really asking two separate questions. That's why you get two separate answers. Here's how you disentangle the two questions. One question is, what does God want for Joseph in the pit where the only obstacle to Joseph's life is restraining snakes and scorpions? Joseph versus snakes and scorpions? The answer is, God wants Joseph alive. It's, it's worth restraining snakes and scorpions to keep Joseph alive. That's one question. Now a separate question. Joseph in the hands of the brothers. Here the question is, is Joseph's life worth restraining the free will of the brothers? That's a separate question. Here we have a separate calculation to make. And here the answer may be, no, free will is so precious. Free will is so important that Joseph's merit isn't enough to keep him alive vis-a-vis vis -vis the free will of the brothers. What you really have here are two separate questions. When you ask, what does God want for Joseph? You're not taking into account that the two cases put Joseph in different conditions where the competition for Joseph's life is different. One is snakes and scorpions and the other is free will. Snakes and scorpions is nature. Nature is just a means, a backdrop against which man acts out his spiritual life. Free will is man's spiritual life. To interfere with free will, you need to be made to be in a very special condition that's worthwhile interfering with what, in, in a certain sense, is the, is, the, is the goal of all the creation. So, it means that if the brothers get hold of him, if Ruin had not intervened, and if Joseph is in that middle category, then the brothers will succeed in killing Joseph, even though Joseph, for himself, independent of free will, God wants him to be alive. He wants him to be alive so much that it'll do a miracle for him in the pit. Even so, if the brothers get hold of him, they will, they will be able to kill him. This is what I mean by the reality of injury. Reality of injury means that free will can cause an outcome which otherwise wouldn't have happened. We shouldn't say, if A injures B or if A kills B, God had already decreed that B should be injured or killed and A was just the instrument. No, it could be that A's free will is what did it. Had A not come into contact with B, B would not have been injured and B would not have died. It's the free will that, that did it. I have about nine references in our literature from the Talmud all the way through the last century which testified to this, uh, to this idea which means that the evil, that, that injury is really possible. Injury is really possible. Are you with me so far? Now let me reduce it a little bit. Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, who was the Rosh Hashiva of 
um, near Israel in Baltimore. I once spoke to him about this. And he put the following qualification on it. Most people live through divine mercy. If we were, oh, I won't speak for you, if I were judged on strict standard of justice, pure justice, that would be, you know, I'd be vaporized, atomized, you know, squashed. There'd be nothing left. But no, God judges us on the basis of mercy and he gives us opportunities and means that we don't really deserve, haven't really earned, at least in this world. And we exist on mercy. When you come up against someone else's free will, you lose mercy. Then God switches to strict judgment. Now, if you'll have a person who's so good, so ideal, that in, in terms of strict justice, he deserves to live, then God will take away free will. God will not allow free will to injure a person who in strict justice has deserved to live. But everyone else, free will is so important that it takes away mercy. This means there's a limit to how much free will can do. This reduces the idea. It's always good to reduce ideas because if they're less content, they're easier to defend. <laughs> uh, and you see this, you see this in the Rambam, the Ramban, others, other sources, a really perfect person or ideal person would not be subject to injury even by other people's free will. But, since most of us exist on mercy, Ruvain's thought was, if Joseph is existing on mercy, then the brothers might kill him even though in his pit he'll, he'll survive. And therefore, I'm saving his life by, by engineering they should throw him into the pit. Which indeed is what happened. He was saved, although we don't know for sure the brothers wouldn't have been stopped, but uh, he was saved that way. Which shows that just as evil in general is, is, is possible, um, injury is also possible as a real outcome, one that wasn't determined <coughs> independently of the free will of the person who um, caused the injury. Yeah. How can a murderer kill an innocent baby considering that they're pure and divine justice? <coughs> well, a baby doesn't have any moral status. Um, you can only be innocent. Well, should we say that, that a cat is innocent? That a gazelle is innocent? Innocent is a moral term. It can only apply to creatures that have moral characteristics. The baby has no moral characteristics. <laughs> okay, as a matter of fact, our sources are divided on this subject. It's a, it's a quite subtle and interesting view uh, question. Whether minors have responsibility, even responsibility for commandments. I know most of you have heard that minors are not obligated to commandments, but it's in fact a disputed view. Some hold that they're not penalized for failure. That doesn't mean they're not obligated. And it can be penal, penal, I mean, penalized for failure goes, comes in grades. So it's a complicated question. It certainly requires what we intuitively would say is maturity, enough maturity to understand what you're doing and appreciate the consequences, understand moral concepts. Without that, for sure not. I, uh, all human beings have free will, at least they have the capacity for free will, that may be overrided, some, overridden in some cases, but uh, all human beings have the capacity for free will. After all, all human beings have mitzvahs. They all have commandments. You don't address a commandment to a squirrel. You address a commandment to a creature that has free will. So uh, we would include all of mankind in that respect. Yeah. <laughs> Is it possible for the opposite to happen? That if someone was really, really bad, that God would take away someone's free will and make him do something bad? And, uh, like, for example, like when the Romans came down to destroy the temple, it was because we were to be punished. In that case, could you say that the Romans were <laughs> Wonderful question. Wonderful question. Let me re re recite it for the tape now. <laughs> I'll answer you. Uh, he asks, uh, can, just as God can take away someone's free will to uh, prevent them from doing something bad, protect someone who's that good, what about God's taking away someone's free will in order to make him do something bad when the, thing, the bad thing needs to be done? Like, for example, the Romans conquering the temple. Okay, first of all, let me just comment on your example. 
the Romans didn't need any encouragement. You know, <laughs> they were out to conquer, and uh, you know, anybody stood in their way, they, they, that was their policy, and they ran that policy for three or four hundred years. So I don't think they needed to have their free will taken away. But a good example would be Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Right? The, the Torah says that God took away Pharaoh's free will. At least that's the way Maimonides reads it. Others read it differently, but to harden his heart, says Maimonides, means that God took away his free will. Now, <clears throat> why did he take away his free will? Maimonides has an astonishing explanation here. He says, by the way, God only hardened his heart in the sixth, eighth, and ninth place. The first five, he hardened his own heart. In addition to all the crimes that he committed before that. So, says Maimonides, God's attitude towards Pharaoh is, you're kaput. No, okay, he didn't say kaput to Maimonides, but that's the idea. You've lived your life and I don't owe you anything. You're such a criminal that you deserve to die immediately. But I need you. I need you. I want you. I want you. I want to prop you up without free will in order to illustrate, in order to illustrate a certain principle that I want to illustrate. Why did he take away his free will? Because God said, I've got, I want to punish him. He's going to be punished. And if he'll use his free will to repent, then I can't punish him. That's absolute. It's the only principle that I have found in our writings which is really absolute. If a person d- repents, does tshuva, he will not be punished. And God said, this guy, this guy's gone so far, I don't want him to get out. And therefore, I'm going to take away his free will so that he won't have the opportunity to repent. It's an amazing statement. You could have solved it otherwise. You could have said, let him repent and I'll punish him anyway. Repentance isn't good enough. Repentance conquers all. Repentance conquers all. Nothing can stand in the way of repentance. So if God wants to punish someone, he just doesn't allow him to to repent. So here's an example where God wants something evil out of the guy for this reason and therefore takes away his free will. So if you meant it to either protect against evil or to cause evil, by taking away free will, you're 100% right. There are cases where God will take away free will in order that the person should do something evil. That's quite correct. Not for the reason that you said, that you, to, hit, to hurt somebody else. Usually, hurting somebody else doesn't require taking away free will. It just requires a monetary incentive or something else, and that's enough to, to get him to do it. Yeah. Um, did you, I didn't hear an example. Can you give an example if you haven't? Of, you know, lives on divine mercy. Um, can you give an example of, of the opposite, the first thing that you said, the first concept that you said? I'm not quite sure which one example of it. Uh, people living on divine mercy, I think, is probably everyone in this room. Yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so, 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 the first concept. So, someone that lives on divine mercy. Um, so, like with Joseph. Joseph didn't qualify. Like, um, like so can you give an example of someone who, if he had been given in this, in honor to his brothers, God would have prevented them from living? They would have taken away the free will of the brothers. Can we give an example of someone who's so good that God will take away free will in order to protect him against injury? Well, God does say this to some of the prophets. <coughs> okay. The prophets indicate that the missions that are sent on are dangerous, and God says, don't worry, no one will touch you. So uh, you, do, you do have that example. Yeah, in the back. <coughs> Okay, he asks, what about uh, going to exile for killing someone unintentionally? And uh, the Gemara indicates that uh, God put him into that condition so that because he needed that uh, punishment for some reason. I don't think you have to go that far in that case. Uh, You only are exiled for killing unintentionally if the murder or the killing was negligent. And negligence is itself a crime. You're negligent in conditions where there was a lethal possibility. And for that, you're punished. Just like every show gig. Every show gig is a, is a question of, of negligence, and the punishment is for the negligence. So we don't have to go quite so far. Now, why would he put the condition where the negligence would cause murder? That's something else. Because why was the guy walking under the ladder at just the moment when he um, clumsily and, and irresponsibly dropped something from the ladder? Then you can say what the Gemara said, but it doesn't mean that's why we're punishing him. We're punishing him because he did something which was negligent and therefore, therefore guilty. Uh, with, with 
without explaining why the why the doctor is doing such a thing, you can understand because the doc, a child won't understand what the the purpose <coughs> of the needle is. A child you can't explain it, but a parent you could explain why why you need that needle. It seems to me that we have suffering, and there might be a need for the suffering, but we're not told what the reason is, and we do have the intellectual capacity. God has given us the intellectual capacity to understand what it is that, uh, what the need for this particular punishment seems that we've had throughout, maybe when you had prophecy we were told, but we, we now go into a whole period of time <coughs> where almost God is not being as good as he could be because he's not, he's not giving us the explanation that we all can do. Okay, the question is, um, the child in the doctor case can't understand the explanation of the pain, but we have the intellectual ability to understand why aren't we given by God a greater understanding of why we suffer the evil that we suffer. Um, I'm not so sure that we have... Well, let me say it this way. Um, our sources tell us that there are many reasons for suffering. In my article, in my book, The Informed Soul, which our school has just re reissued, um, there's an article on suffering there. I think I have 12 reasons. But that's not exhaustive. There are dozens of, and dozens of reasons. We have many reasons why people suffer. Many. Now, when the Talmud reports that Moses asked God why righteous people suffer, and wicked people prosper. And God said to him, that's something which you can't know. The commentaries explain, he was asking for the ability to tell in a particular case why this person is suffering. If I have 35 reasons why people suffer, I don't know which ones apply to Ruve. Right? So, um, there God said, that you can't see. That you can't see. Now, he said it to Moses. Which means, not only can't we understand it with wisdom, can't even get it with prophecy. That's something which, being in this world, makes it impossible to see. As uh, prophecy is only what you can get in this world. Right? It's part of Kilo Yerani Hodam Bachai. No one can see me and live. So if you ask intellectually to understand why suffering goes on in general, we have a lot of that. God gave us a lot of explanations for that. If you ask to pin it on a particular person and say, why is he suffering? No, I don't know. But I don't think I need that. I don't think I need that. All I need to know is that the suffering in the world is within the limits that can be justified by the reasons that God gave us for it. And it's definitely within those limits when you see the variety of reasons. And one of the reasons, after all, though I haven't had time to do this with you, but it is on the website, one of the reasons is uh, reincarnation. We often take a person's life and we compare it with his suffering and say, gosh, you know, nobody's perfect, but... Given his life, he doesn't deserve to suffer like that. I suppose you were told that your observation is only of one twentieth of his life. And nineteen twentieths you didn't see. So then you say, well, so then I can't make a judgment. I mean, how can I compare his life with the suffering if I haven't seen his life? Quite right. You can't. And reincarnation means he's had a lot more life, lives than we can see. This world isn't, doesn't give us the ability to see that. That's one element of the, of the picture. I will tell you, and then I'm going to quit, that Ramban has a, a, a really, really important uh, remark that he makes in the Shara Gmul, where he talks about death and, and reward and punishment. When he talks about the book of Job. Job suffered horribly. He had three friends who came to commiserate with him. And in the discussion, the three friends said to Job, essentially, God's running the world, God is just, you're suffering, he's punishing you, you're guilty. And he said, I'm not guilty. In the end, God says to the friend, you have spoken about Job in a way that was not right. You spoke about Job in a way that was not right. Asked the Ramban, what should the friends have done? What should they have said? What should they have thought? The friends sound very from, actually. They sound very pious. You know, God's running the world and he's suffering. So then God's just, so therefore he must be guilty. A lot of people would echo that sentiment naturally, spontaneously. 
God says, you shouldn't have spoken that. Now, this is what the Ramban says. This Ramban, for me, as a logician, is really astonishing. It's astonishing and, and so in, it's very encouraging. The Ramban says that the friend should have said this. God's running the world. God is just and he's suffering. Job must be guilty. Job tells us he's innocent. Job is honest. Job is credible. There's no reason to doubt his word. Therefore, Job is innocent. I, we have now contradicted ourselves. Correct. We've now contradicted ourselves. And now, live with the contradiction. Don't blink. Don't, don't use one half to overpower the other half. Live with the contradiction. I know that God is just. If he's suffering, he must be guilty. On the other hand, Job is honest and sincere. There's no reason to doubt his word. He must be telling the truth. I have a contradiction. Okay, so live with it. You don't have to solve every contradiction. There are difficult problems in the world. Math has difficult problems. Science has difficult problems. Theology can have a difficult problem. And then says the Ramban, one step further, understand that there's something in the tradition that answers this question, and you don't have it. That's why you are puzzled by this contradiction, because you haven't come across the solution. Now, the Ramban indicates in a number of places that the solution is reincarnation. Watch what happens to this terrible contradiction once you put in the idea of reincarnation. The Job says he's innocent and there's no reason to doubt his word. Is Job right? Sure he's right. He's innocent in this life, which is all he knows. So what he says is 100% correct. The, the friends say that he's guilty because God is just and is running the world and punishing him. Are they right? Sure they're right. They're right because he's punishing him for what he did in a previous lifetime. The contradiction just disappears. It just disappears. And that's a good example of how something that can look like an absolute contradiction, something with no way out, can have a simple way out. And uh, until you've found the way out, you live with the contradiction. You don't use one side to override the other side. Yeah. I didn't say it your way. I didn't say God created the world out of loving kindness. I said He created it for the sake of loving kindness. Loving kindness is the goal of the world. It's the goal of the world. But isn't the creation a result of actual divorce from the oneness of Hashem? But that hasn't been realized in... Well, look, okay, uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden is a long story. I recommend you read Rav Dester's essay on the subject, which has been translated into English. Uh, that's not going to help us now. Um, God had to set up a world which is less than ideal in order to get to a world which is ideal. Loving kindness says that if there's an evil means which is necessary to get to a greater good, then loving kindness says to use it. Just like the doctor who injects the child and causes him pain, he's doing that out of loving kindness, isn't he? So it's not a contradiction of loving kindness that there will be a stage in the in the development which is less than ideal because... So are you saying that before loving kindness came there was some kind of evil that happened that actually led to the creation of this world? No, 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 no. It's not before loving kindness. It's loving kindness that creates the evil. Imagine a doctor sitting there with the child. What shall he do? What is he motivated by? He's motivated only by loving kindness. Now, shall he stick him with the needle or not? Of course he has to stick him with the needle. I it hurts the child and that's evil, but that's the only way to get to the good. So the motivation that you start with here is loving kindness. Nothing before the loving kindness that's evil. There's only loving kindness, but you're in a situation where the only way to get to the good is through the evil. That's right. Yeah. Um, a large part of the explanation of evil seems to be under the justice and evil that exists is based on the idea of reincarnation in what I'm getting that if you take the entire life or many lives as a whole, then you can understand or explain in, you know, evil in a righteous person's life. But, I mean, I guess, I know we have limited time, but I find the idea of reincarnation just difficult to understand. And if I have no connection to my other lives or reincarnation or, you know, in this world I can't comprehend it, I have, can't relate to it, then how does that really serve... I guess I just find that very unsatisfying. Um, okay, well, you, you find re reincarnation very unsatisfying. First of all, you should go to my website and look at the sources and see that it is part of our tradition. 
Um, but let me give you a couple of analogies which might help uh, a little bit. Um, imagine a person robs a bank and in so doing kills some of the bank tellers. It's a pretty you know, gory thing. And then a year later, while well, he's still at large, he has an accident and the result of the accident is total amnesia. And now they catch him because he's not running anymore <laughs> because he'd forgotten about the bank robbery, right? Should they put him in jail? I don't know. It's a good question. I, I don't think anybody will hesitate by saying put him in jail. You, you did this and, and you, you're guilty of the crime. In fact, you don't remember the crime. doesn't mean you didn't com- commit the crime. Let's pu- push amnesia a little bit. What happens at amnesia? What do you forget? Everything? Total amnesia. What do you forget? Everything. No. You remember how to tie your shoes. You remember how to dial a telephone? One second. You remember how to dial a telephone, right? You remember how to drive a car? You remember that the red light is stop and the, and the green light is go? You don't forget everything. What you forget is your personal history. Your personal history, right? But now, forgetting your personal history doesn't mean you change character. Doesn't you change character? Consider traumatic, exa- traumatic events that take place to a child. Uh, actually, there are cases where a parent will throw a child, oh, well, it's terrible, but they'll throw a child into the water and let him, you know, sink or swim. The child may be traumatized by water for the rest of his life. He may forget the incident. He just never will learn to swim because he's traumatized. So the event, the fact that I forget the event doesn't mean that my character, the character that led me to perform the action, the result of the action on my character doesn't go, goes away. This person is a bank robber, a, a vicious bank robber, though he happens to forget that he did that. He still belongs in jail. Right? Character carries over. Character carries over, even though the memory of the actual events doesn't carry over. Okay, good. That's no, I, I had more to say, but that, that, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, but just about that, like if you're a completely different embodiment, or if you have no idea of what you've done, will the punishment even do anything to you? Like if you're supposed to learn from the punishment, let's say, I don't know, are you? Because if you're supposed to learn from the punishment, let's say, yeah. and by having no recollection of what you've done, you're just being punished, you know, I have no idea. What did I say just before you asked your question? What did I say? What? what? So the point of the punishment is to change the person's character, isn't it? Right, but if you just punish someone, right, and they don't know what it is you're punishing, then they're not necessarily going to change. Well, he will certainly know. We'll tell him. We'll tell him we have proof that you robbed this bank. He'll know. He just won't remember it. But we'll tell him you robbed this bank, and that's why you're being punished. Okay, with this I'm going to quit because uh, we're really we're really stirring the soup now. Does this have any connection with the end justifies the means? Listen, boys and girls, I'm going to tell you something important to know. The whole question of whether or not the end justifies the means is a red herring. It's a it's a non question. You should reject the terminology and reject the question altogether. Don't talk about whether the end justifies the means. Talk about which package is superior in your alternatives. Here's an example. A guy has gangrene in his foot. What are my alternatives? Leave the gangrene and he dies, cut off the foot foot and he lives. Which is the better package? Cutting off the foot and he lives, right? Is that the end justifies the means? You're cutting off his foot so he should live? The end is justifying the means? Forget about ends, forget about means. Each action has a package of consequences. Some are immediate and some are long term. Talk about the whole package. Dividing the consequences into ends and means does no good to clarify what you should do. Calling the one ends and calling the other means makes absolutely no difference. Just talk about the sum total value of the package as a package. Right? So then take the sum total. You're staying with the present situation or robbing the rich, which is called taxes, actually. Right? Taxes collected by bayonets, where the rich pay for the poor. Right? Where, so you have two package deals. People staying the way they are, where a lot of people, star, poor people starving and getting no medical attention, versus a package deal where you victimize the rich by taking away their money against their will to service the poor. Which package is a better package? Don't talk about ends and means. Ends and means will only confuse the issue. Just talk about the package, which is the way people... Yes, if you could do that, then it would be a much better package, right? It would be a better package, quite right. Because there's no, no, evil, no, no evil in it whatsoever, right? So th- th- this idea of ends and means, which when the communists were popular, 
Thank God we're finished with that. I, but, uh, when the communists were popular, um, this became a point of gigantic debate. And it was totally meaningless. It was totally useless, the whole debate. Does the end justify the means? Does the end justify the means? The whole thing is false by dividing up the consequences of what you do into ends and means. The division makes absolutely no difference. A thing's not more <laughs> important because it's called ends, or more important because it's called means, or less important because it's called means. Each thing has its value. Take the sum total and see which is the better or which is the worst alternative. Okay.